So as Jesus, as he preaches the whole of the Sermon on the Mount in you know, Matthew uh, chapters 5 through 7, he is actually summoning those who would follow him on the way to live a life of how to live a life of radical dependence upon the Lord. In fact, it's the how-to's of an awesome life of radical devotion to Jesus Christ and to Him alone. And as Jesus begins the Sermon on the Mount, He sends out His all-star lead-off hitter, the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes lay out for us the character traits that should emanate from our lives as a result of our close walk with Jesus Christ. They are the very fruit of our lives that put when we put the Lord first in everything that we do. The first four of the Beatitudes, as we were reminded last week, they have more of a vertical dimension you know, to them. It is more about the inner traits that we have, or the character that we have within as we depend upon our relationship with God Himself. And then the last four, the last four Beatitudes are a direct result of that vertical relationship that we have with the Lord. And those four, they emphasize for us a horizontal movement as they focus on our traits that we exude in our our external relationships with those around us. So if you are visiting with us this morning, we have been doing a study on the Beatitudes, and we've been doing it since about June, early June. And so I'm going to do something a little actually different to kind of change it up some for us. I'm going to ask all of you to read along with me from the Beatitudes, from Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. So please read read out loud along with me. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven." For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So over the past uh, several weeks, we have been rightly reminded of what that word uh, blessed actually means. It occurs nine times in these Beatitudes. And we were cautioned to think about them as the human emotion of happy, although they do transliterate as happy. Happy are those. But Happiness or being happy is oftentimes understood as a human emotion that changes with our circumstances. So instead of thinking just about them as as happiness, but it is happiness in being found in favor with the Lord as we devote ourselves to godly obedience. Then when this happens, when we radically devote ourselves to Him, to these spiritual truths that are before us, they reflect the kingdom of heaven. Then God declares to us, and He gives to us of the the benefits that are listed in the Beatitudes. Now before we move on, I want to talk a little bit about the other word or the phrase that appeared a few times in the Beatitudes because it is a phrase that we see throughout the Gospel of Matthew, and that is the kingdom of heaven. And in the kingdom of heaven... Matthew repeats this multiple times because he wants us, the readers of the gospel, to think about what it means to be part of the kingdom of heaven. See, in Christ, in Jesus Christ, God has sent His Son into the world to bring about the kingdom of heaven on earth. 
And he invites us to partake of this kingdom through a life of holiness, through a life of righteousness, and through a life of faithful devotion to the Father's will. We oftentimes pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. But guess what? When we are in Christ, as Paul says in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. And then we see it again at the end of the Gospel of Matthew when Jesus gives the great uh, commission. At the end of that, he says what? Truly or surely, I will be with you always to the end of the age. When he says he will be with us, it's not he's up there and we're down here and that's a nice thought to have. It's a reality that we have when we are in Jesus Christ by the power of his Holy Spirit. So friends, when we talk about the kingdom of heaven... And when we talk about Jesus Christ inaugurating that kingdom of heaven on earth, which which hasn't come in its fullness yet, but it one day will, amen, we are called as subjects of that kingdom to be partakers of it and to let God's holiness shine through us, to let His goodness shine through us. These beatitudes lay out for us as does the rest of the Sermon on the Mount, what it looks like to be subjects in God's kingdom. And our focus today then is on the seventh beatitude, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Now before we move on, we need to dispel some misconceptions about what peacemaking is not. Blessed are the peacemakers does not mean Blessed are those who ignore a problem and cross their fingers in the hope that it will go away. Neither do peacemakers hide our head in the sand. We cannot do that. We are called to a different way of life. The reason is, not just because we're called to that, but when we ignore a problem, when we ignore the command to be peacemakers, that problem almost always gets worse. Just like with things at the house, when we, when we ignore uh, the gutters, which I currently am right now, <laughs> that problem's just going to get worse. I have to attack it. And blessed are the peacemakers does not mean that we deny that there even is a problem out there, that there is conflict, and we don't make excuses for the conflict as to why it is happening and why it needs resolved. Nor do peacemakers sit idly by and wait for somebody else to step in. And finally, blessed are the peacemakers does not mean that we try to appease all the parties that are involved in the dispute or passively compromise the truth when we see that, this, that the people involved in the conflict or the dispute don't agree with us. Because in trying to make everybody happy, Trying to appease everybody, you make everybody mad. And God is not glorified. All these things just lead to resentment, and the unresolved issues always get worse. I think we would all agree today that the world is in desperate need of peace. At this very moment, while we are sitting in this room, there are 110 armed conflicts going on around the world, according to one source affecting and impacting tens of millions of people. But what if all of a sudden, all of those you know, conflicts ceased? Does that mean that we have peace? Too often we try to define peace by the absence of war. Well, friends, just because the bullets and the missiles are not flying overhead does not mean that everything is hunky-dory. Ceasefires between nations are oftentimes opportunities for leaders and governments and the militaries to regroup and reload. Wars are armed, sorry, wars and armed conflicts are inevitable in our fallen world. We know this, and Jesus even reminds us of this. But militaries cannot garner the peace that God promises to us. Even if we stop and examine the human uh, condition a little closer to home, the picture does not improve much. We see our nation 
rapidly uh, deteriorating before our eyes in many ways. We see hatred and name-calling. It's the norm now. It's justified. Your property gets destroyed with no consequences. Violence against one another is excused, all in the name of what you believe if you're on the right side. The news nowadays is almost always dire. I try to avoid it. Rampant sin and perversion are being celebrated throughout society. Scandals and schisms are reaching new heights, and that is true even for churches. Thank God it's not happening here. It seems like we are in the midst of a moral freefall, and the moral compass is almost always pointing down. To make matters worse, what people love to do then is to get on social media and rant and rave about the people they disagree with. They go on destructive little kind of rants and they start to demean the people that they don't agree with. The people that we are called by Christ to be witnesses to. Proverbs 15.1 says, A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Those that God that he calls to bring about peace, oftentimes become part of the problem rather than part of the solution. We must take care, believers, that we are not part of the problem. Social media does not foster peace. Neither can the governments bring about the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said in John eighteen thirty six, My kingdom is not of this world then let's bring it even closer to home. We only need to look at ourselves, our own families, our schools, our communities, our places of work. What do we see? There's a lot of good going on. I want to be all actually negative, but there is a lot of bad things happening too because we see brokenness. We see gossip. We see backstabbing, addiction, bullying, hunger, crime, illegal things are taking place. This is far from the peace that God, that God calls us to. This is far from God's kingdom. Why is it so? Why is all of this so? When Christians, we work hard, we pray for peace. I pray for peace every day. And we're commanded to be peacemakers. The simple answer is disobedience sin, and evil. Ephesians 2, 1 through 2 reminds us of the corrupt world that we live in. Paul says, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Jesus was born into a world of sin and disobedience, into a world filled with kingdoms and leaders and people that were all set against the way of God's peace. The threat of violence loomed large in the first century, and Rome rolled with an iron fist. All we need to do is turn you know, back a few chapters and look at Matthew 2. King Herod, how did he respond from the good or from uh, the wise men when they you know, really came and asked him where the king of the Jews was born? so that they might go and worship him. How did he respond? He had everybody, all the male children, two years old and younger, he had them all killed in Bethlehem and the surrounding region. The lack of peace was as evident then as it is now. So how do we become peacemakers in a fallen and evil world? Before we get to talking about peacemaking, though, we need to define what true peace is. We need to be clear on the biblical definition at of peace as it pertains to the beatitude. And we also need to understand how we receive it first. Biblical peace is more than just the absence of something, like violence or noise or chaos, although the absence of these things is part of the overall definition. And it's also more than just that inner calm we feel or sense of security that we feel. It is those things, but it is so much more than those things. Rather, the meaning of the, of the Greek word peace is very closely uh, related to the Hebrew word shalom. And it connotes 
harmony, wholeness, and well-being in all areas of life, personally, relationally, and communally. There are too many people who call ourselves Christians who don't have this kind of peace in our lives today. The only way to know the peace that God promises to us is to personally know and believe in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who is the Prince of Peace. Amen. In God's covenant with Israel, He promised peace to His chosen people, to His children. And He said in Leviticus 26, verse 6, I will give peace in the land, and you shall lie down, and none shall make you afraid. The peace that God promised came only, though, as a result of Israel's obedience to the Lord. And it was never fully realized due to Israel's sin, the same sin that we are steeped in today, that the world is steeped in uh, today. And our sin, it separates us from God. It puts us at enmity with Him. But God is the God of peace. He is not only the covenant maker, but He he is the covenant keeper. And He had to deal with humanity's sin in order for His people to begin to know what true peace is all about. And Isaiah 54.10 reminds us of this truth. For the mountains may depart and the hills be removed, but my steadfast love shall not depart from you. And my covenant of peace shall not be removed, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. God had to deal with our sinful condition and our separation from Him in order to bring His people peace. This is what had to happen. And so, we see in Isaiah 50, uh, sorry, 53, 5, this plan unfold as it points to Jesus Christ. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And the Lord, and upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. No one... Absolutely no one can become a peacemaker without first turning to Jesus Christ. Jesus alone is our salvation. Jesus alone is our peace. And only in and through Him and by the blood of His cross can we have peace with God and be reconciled to Him. Our relationship is restored. Colossians 1, 19-20 states, For in Him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through Him to reconcile to Himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. Reconciliation with God through Jesus Christ and receiving His peace go hand in hand. His promise of peace is both for our lives right at this very moment, and that peace, that promise lasts into eternity. Man, that's something to think about, that we have Christ's peace. We have peace that can deal with anything that we are facing in this world. Many of you have probably experienced this kind of peace. It's described in the Bible as the peace that surpasses all understanding. Amen. So for us to be true peacemakers, we must first die to our old way of life, that is repent of our sin, and we must put our faith in Jesus Christ. If you don't know peace in your life today, then maybe you have yet to give yourself to Jesus Christ. Or if you don't know Christ's peace today, maybe... You've only given a little bit of your life to Jesus. He commands all of it. Maybe there's still something you're holding on to. Friends, give all that you are, all that you will be to Jesus, and He will give you His peace. And if you have yet to receive His peace, I invite you to come and speak with me after the service this morning. Once we have made peace then with God through Jesus Christ and our relationship with Him has been restored, we are called, we are commanded to be peacemakers. And there's a benefit. We shall be called sons of God. This doesn't mean that we can earn this title through our efforts. 
in what we do in peacemaking. Rather, peacemaking is what the sons of God do. Galatians 3.26 reiterates this point, for in Christ Jesus, you all are sons of God through faith. So when we are received into the family of God through faith, we become the children of God, and we receive the promises that God has made to us through Jesus Christ, our brother. Romans 8, 14 through 19 reminds us that through Christ, we have received the spirit of adoption, and we have become heirs with God and co-heirs with Jesus Christ. In ancient Israel, the family's inheritance was often handed down to the sons, and the, and the oldest son received a double of uh, the portion. Our inheritance as sons of of God is for all of his children, his daughters, and his sons. And part of that is the promise of peace in our lives. It is the constant peace, the constant presence of the Spirit of the Lord in us and the gift of new and everlasting life. You know, isn't it amazing how as we age, we find ourselves in so many ways, becoming more and more like our parents, for better or for worse. As I moved from my 20s into my 30s, I found myself realizing, man, I'm really becoming like my dad. Just with little things that happened, it would hit me. That is something that my dad would do, or that is something that my dad would have said. Well, why is that so? That's because I spent a lot of time with my dad. And when you spend a lot of time with you know, you know, somebody, you sort of take on the characteristics that they have, especially with a parent. And this is true for the children of the Lord as well. The children of God then should mimic the ways of our Heavenly Father. And the longer we walk with Him, the more that we live into His mercy and into His righteousness and allow our hearts to be daily purified by Him, the more we become like Him through Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit according to His Word. Like Father, like Son, our Father is the God of peace. Our brother Jesus Christ is the peacemaker And we have been given the ministry of peacemaking and reconciliation. So, a peacemaker is a child of God who promotes shalom in our own lives and relationships and reconciles people with God and with one another. Let's look first at what it means to foster peace in our own lives. Hebrews 12, 14 says... Strive for peace with everyone and for holiness without which no one will see the Lord. This means that we bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit in our lives, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. All these things are included in our peacemaking. And parents, guess what? This includes us with the way that we raise our children. We must be good examples at home of what it means to be a peacemaker. This is why I sometimes tell parents, hey, don't take every single argument or debate that you have behind closed doors. Sometimes you got to do it in front of the children. I get oftentimes we need to do it behind closed doors too. But kids need to see the, that their mom and dad can work things out and how they do it. They need to see what it means to consider the other and to compromise and to make peace. Otherwise, oftentimes they might just hear arguing and shouting and then they don't see the peace that is often made after that. We must live peaceably by putting the needs of others before ourselves. We must be forgiving. I think of you know, Joseph back in Genesis when he was sold into slavery by all of his brothers. And guess what? Joseph had a pretty hard life, but God used him, and God raised him up eventually to become Pharaoh's second-hand man. And what did Joseph do when in time of great famine, his brothers came to Egypt looking for food, for relief? He forgave them. 
and he gave to those in need. We give to those in need. Peacemakers are slow to anger. Peacemakers learn to tame our tongue. We rejoice with others. We mourn with those who mourn. And peacemakers consistently turn away from evil to do good. Sounds a lot like our last three sermons we've had, is huh? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are those who show mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart. All of those things, in a way, are pre- prerequisites to peacemaking. But people who constantly love to argue, love to gossip, love to control others and strong, strong arm others, and are always critical, these are the people that can never become peacemakers that God desires until they repent of those ways. We all know people like this, don't we? Do you like being around people like that? Being controlling and critical? No, we oftentimes avoid them. But guess what? That's the front line of peacemaking that God calls us into. God calls us into confronting them with love and with wisdom. When I once was asked what the most difficult commandment to follow is, I immediately replied, Matthew chapter 5, verses 44 to 45, and it says, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. Sounds a lot like blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. I had a hard time in my life loving my enemies. Thank God he has changed my heart, but people that I considered my enemies, people that I did not like, I didn't pray for. But then when I came across this verse, it hit me, and I began to pray for my enemies. And the more I prayed for them, the easier it became to love them, to see them as someone created in the image of God who Christ died for, and they have yet to come to put their faith in Him and know His a transformed life. Friends, we must bathe our peacemaking efforts in prayer, and we must daily be transformed by the study of the Word of the Lord. Next, peacemakers entail someone who actively promotes God's Word to help reconcile others to the Lord. In short, we point others to Jesus Christ. When we come across people who don't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, opportunity, it knocks right there for all of us. It's a moment where we can be used by God to bring about God's peace into the life of someone who doesn't know the Prince of Peace. We could point them to Jesus Christ. And many times people who are steeped in a destructive lifestyle, who are living in sin, they oftentimes are hurt. They oftentimes want to know God's peace. They just don't realize it yet. And they might be crying out from within, and that's an opportunity because that opens up the door to, you know, to their heart for Jesus to do something amazing in their life. And what an opportunity it is when He calls us to partake in that. What an opportunity it is when we get to be the participants in the ministry of reconciliation. So I ask you... Who is the Holy Spirit putting in your life today for you to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with? God wants you to tell others about what He has done for you. There are probably situations in your life that you have faced where you have come to know God's peace. Share those situations with others. Speak peace into the lives of others by speaking the name of Jesus Christ and pointing others to Him. Could be somebody in your own family. Could be somebody in this room right now. Could be an old friend, a co-worker, a classmate. Seek the Lord and see where He's pointing you to share the gospel. The gospel of hope and peace. Finally, peacemakers build bridges with others who are at odds with one another. They unite people. That means that we got to take the initiative. we got to get involved into the messy lives of others. We engage at times in conflict 
Not to inflame it, but with the purpose of working towards resolving it. As I said, that gets messy. It's hard. I know. We've all been there. But neither was it easy for Jesus to make the way for our peace. Cost him his life. Scripture encourages us to live in harmony with one another. So we speak up in love. Peacemakers rely on God's wisdom. We confront bullies. We rescue the oppressed and save those who are being forced into various types of servitude. Many of you are uh, familiar with a movie that's out today that is a box office hit called The Sound of Freedom. And it depicts the lives of sexual servitude, those who are caught up in it as children, and those also who are in the, uh, the ministry of rescuing them. From one source, it says that over 30 million people are involved in this type of modern-day slavery, whether it's servitude of work or servitude of sex, but this is the world we live in, and this is a low estimate, according to most people. And guess what? It's a $150 billion industry. So evil is going to run to this because evil is going to want to make money off of, off of others. But peacemakers run and they rescue the oppressed. That is what we are called to do. We discourage vindictive ways in others. We rebuke those who persist in sin against another. And peacemakers warn others against being idle, against being disruptive. And we ask people who constantly complain and constantly gossip about others to go and resolve their differences with that person. I'm reminded of a story of a good friend of mine who, when she started a new job as a young uh, professional, she went in, into the office and there was, a, there was another woman there who was, felt kind of threatened by her. And this woman started to gossip about her quite a bit, talk about her a lot, to the point where she did not even want to show up to work because it was a small office. There was nowhere for her to hide. The gossip kept happening. She got fed up. She went to her boss, who thankfully was a Christian, and she said, please stop this nonsense. I can't work in this environment. Instead of doing anything you know, separately or after the fact, her boss in that very moment, the moment that she came into his office to ask for help, he brought the other woman into his office and sat them down and they began to work out the differences. That's what peacemakers do. She said that she learned more about peacemaking in that moment and then as she rose up into management, she used that experience in her life to bring about peace between others in her place of work and also in her family and friends. Things don't always work out that way, do they? Peacemaking is tough. In 1781, Ben Franklin wrote to John Adams, Blessed are the peacemakers, I suppose, is for another world. In this world, they are frequently cursed. Attempts at peacemaking often fail, but friends, we are still responsible to get involved in the business of peacemaking. Romans 12, 18 says, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. As far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. We cannot change people's hearts. That is the work of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. But that does not excuse us from our biblical mandate to be peacemakers. We must seek peace and pursue it. So friends, where is God calling you today? Where is God calling you to bring about peace between others who are at odds with one another? Take courage. Pray, look to Christ, and work for peace between people who are at odds with one another. 
And as we wrap up this morning, I want to close with a blessing from Numbers chapter 6, verses 24 to 26. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his face to you and give you peace. And may you share his peace with all others. Friends, let's pray. Lord God, as we think about this thing called peacemaking, and you call us to be peacemakers, we know it's not an easy task, Lord. Neither was it an easy task for you to bring about your peace, for it cost you your life. But we are grateful for what you have done and the work that you have done on the cross and the ministry. By your ministry, you showed us what it means to be peacemakers and how to go about doing it. And Lord, we can't do it alone. We can't do it on our own. It involves a close walk with you, a close relationship with you. But Lord, give us your peace. Help us to live peaceably with all others. And help us, Lord, to be peacemakers everywhere that we go. That you would be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.